to slow me down and to cost us money and try to bleed our bank account. I think that that's been a directive that's kind of moved all the way down. And I've asked the question, I've been very bold, I've been very upfront, and I've actually asked this question both of the Crown Council, but I've also asked the question at the department level. I've asked this questions of the ministers. I've said to them, I said, if I hit all these check marks and I'm doing all these things correctly, what's the problem here? Today is the second part of three on the despicable control over the constriction of the liberals who comes to ruin the life of people who desperately seek an affordable place to live. That price tag for a house is just too high. We can all agree that the status quo is not working. Justin Trudeau loved bureaucracy, and since he has been in power, people are poorer, People can no longer afford a home and there is more and more polarization on topics as crazy as the hysteria of climate change. The government and the institution that have been set up to regulate the constriction use the veil of the fight against climate change as well as the protection of the environment as an excuse, all to delay or reject projects. This reverses the economic progress. We literally have a lack of affordable housing, a housing crisis, period. At the same time, as governments are making construction more difficult, the authorities are increasing immigration considerably. As we all seen, with irregular immigration. Of course, that contributes to the demand for housing, which is not growing. But this demand is not satisfied. And every year, the gap between housing supply and demand are growing. During this time, companies such as Sundance Construction exerted their patience to fill out a multitude of documents to pass repetitive tests that were unnecessary and ultimately result in an unfavorable decision. Today, we discuss the problem encountered by the CEO of Sundance Construction, Jocelyn Burzwick, to move forward with her home construction project in the Sandy Hook area near Gimli, Manitoba. Sundance Construction has already built several units in Manitoba and Ontario. They have also been involved in sewer and water upgrade and have provided emergency services to repair sewer and water treatment system in many rural and northern communities. Nevertheless, Burzwick efforts to get a subdivision approved are emblematic of Canada incompetent bureaucratic process. Today, for the second part, she describes the beginning of her nightmare. Of 2020, so it was August 23rd, 2022. Climate Parks comes back after we submitted our drainage plan, sent them an update on the flooding situation um, and all of, and gave them the claim number for EMO. They said, you know what? We think that you have three wetlands on your property. And they said to me, well, we want you to pay compensation because we think that this was originally a class three wetland. And I gave them not only did I give them all the aerial photographs, topographical uh, surveys, we had Isaac and Denchuk come out, survey the property in May before we did any digging uh, so that we knew historically what was there. We had historical photographs showing that it was a farm, which means is that my lands were all disturbed via agriculture, which means we have no wetlands. And they just didn't understand the, the definition of a wetland, but they fought. So we gave them the information, we gave them the engineering, we gave them the soil samples, we gave them all of this. And they said, we are going to penalize you. We're gonna block 
your subdivision and we are going to hold back approval on your subdivision until you pay us money. So originally they wanted 33,000. I got them down to $13,000 because I proved that the area they were talking about um, wasn't being impacted. And then also I went through uh, a huge fight to try and get the area reclassified. And then when you pay us the money, we're not even gonna guarantee you that you're gonna get your license. We can give you that license whenever we feel like it. And I asked for a timeline and they said, we're not gonna give you that timeline. We don't, we don't know what that timeline is. So we actually had to engage Crown Council for the province of Manitoba. And I was able to sit with them in February. We were able to lay out all of the information. We were able to lay out all the engineering, the all the photographs, all the evidence, everything that we had to show where we truly were um, as a wetland or not a wetland. And the Crown said is that, you know what? This whole process seems off. So how about we do this? How about we separate the, the wetland issue? How about we separate it from the housing project? Because there is no um, reason to delay the housing project based on this. So what they asked me to do was take $13,000, give it to Manitoba Habitat and Heritage in trust. And they said is that now I can focus on getting the reclassification done and then when the reclassification is done and we prove what I'd said all, all along, then they're going to give me back my money. But I still have to put up $13,000 in order to just get to the point of, of this dispute process. The Crown Council actually was like both Crown Councils were amazing. They were very professional. They knew their stuff. It was a really good conversation that, that we were able to have with them, with my engineering team and my lawyers. And they actually solved part of the problem. But how many individuals have the ability to do that, to get to that point? I mean, I was in the process already. Like I had projects in the pipe where we're already dealing with council. So we were able to deal with this. Do you feel that the, the this is a personal vendetta and they use the umbrella of the climate change and the protection of the environment to go and stop you to do your project? That's absolutely. Because the level of documentation that I have to provide for everything is so excessive. Like if, if somebody were in a similarly similar situation and you look at it and you look at how much documentation that they would provide in order to 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 kind of make their case and, and to have things move forward. And then you look at the amount of information that's required for me to be able to do the same things. You're kind of wondering like, what's going on? Like the people that have come here, so outside engineering, I've had engineering right from Ontario, so from Burlington. Uh, one of the engineers that worked on my project actually giving me the base engineering for everything, he used to be the director of Environment Canada Sewer and Water Research Division. So that's the, that's the guy. He's got a PhD in civil engineering and in mechanical engineering. That's the guy that I've been doing all my engineering collaboration with. And when you so when you look at this, we're one of the only subdivisions in Manitoba that hit all these climate goals. We're low flow in terms of water usage. We are low production of sewage effluent and we're treating it all on site without chemicals. We're using zero chemicals on site anywhere in terms of like landscaping, land application, anything like that. We are low energy use because we are a high efficiency build. So I'm using about 46% energy overall. So we have a combination of both natural gas and electricity, but the amount of energy that I use overall is like 46% less proven than most households in Canada. So I've hit every single check mark. So we've hit the efficiency check mark. We've hit the, the water check mark in terms of environmental um, engineering in 
in terms of sewer and water. On top of that, we've got community gardens designed into this. We've got 2,000 feet of walking trail built into this. We've got 2,000 feet of um, the bioswales built into this. We've got natural retention areas built into this. We connect to zero municipal infrastructure. And I have almost zero impact on provincial infrastructure. And I am zero discharge to Lake Winnipeg. So there's no other subdivision in Manitoba that provides every single check mark. I mean, and we have alternative energy in terms of backup solar panels. Every home allowed to operate off grid in case of an emergency. So if the whole area goes down, which it has, my subdivision fires back up. So I have everything working in terms of that. I'm an indigenous builder and I used 80% indigenous engineering local to Manitoba. So if you were looking at the check marks, what every government looks at to say, wow, I think we've got a good project here. I did it. And on top of that, I used engineering design that is so forward thinking in terms of common sense, but also efficiency. It should be a no brainer. When I talk to some of our colleagues engineering that have worked with the province of Manitoba in the drainage section and in watershed management, they both said the same thing to me. They said is that Jocelyn, the province of Manitoba should be paying you money for the watershed management that you have done on your own as an individual and the, the future impact you are going to have on the watershed going forward because my water for drainage isn't hitting Lake Winnipeg and it isn't hitting that. We're putting all of our water back to the aquifer. So last year, Manitoba ran all these programs where they said, okay, we want, um, because we're flooding, they said is that, hey, homeowners, we want you guys to start putting together bioswales. We'd like to see you rerouting and holding water on your property. We want to see you slowing down water as it leaves your property. We want to see you cleaning your water through vegetation before it leaves your property. Well, I do all of that. I do all of that. And people were paid money in the province of Manitoba to do that. But Climate and Parks said, no, 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 Jocelyn. We want you to give us money. Even though you've done the work yourself, You've hit all of our requirements. You are holding water for the province of Manitoba and, and saving their infrastructure. We still want you to pay us money. So when I look at all those things, you have to say to yourself, what is actually going on? Um, you have an idea? I, I do. I have a couple of different ideas. Um, I think that this came down directly from some pretty high places in the province of Manitoba to slow me down and to cost us money and try to bleed our bank account. I think that that's been a directive that's kind of moved all the way down. And I've asked the question, I've been very bold, I've been very upfront, and I've actually asked this question both of the Crown Council, but I've also asked the question, at the department level, I've asked these questions of the ministers. I've said to them, I said, if I hit all these check marks and I'm doing all these things correctly, what's the problem here? Is this an ego problem? Is this, you just don't like me as a builder? Is this payback for me having been a whistleblower? What literally is the problem? Is the problem the fact that I don't, you know, jump through the hoops when you want me to jump through the hoops. I mean, I'm pretty outspoken in terms of um, our stand on, you know, charter rights and things like that. I'm, I've always spoken out about that and employee rights and things like that. So I keep asking the question, what is the problem? If I've done the engineering correctly, if I'm not impacting infrastructure, if I'm providing a net benefit to the RM of Gimli in terms of providing housing and tax base, what's the problem? Why can't anybody get this done? Now, I've had some people tell me is that not only is it coupled with they just they, they just don't want to see me succeed. It's also incompetence. Like when we took looked at the province of Manitoba in terms of the actual department for climate and parks, they no longer have the people um, that were capable of being able to review these projects in a timely manner, but also provide coherent feedback. So and then I come along. 
and I'm breaking all the rules. I'm giving them the engineering. I'm doing everything for them. I'm not asking for any money. I'm not asking for any assistance in terms of programming and things like that. And on top of all of that, then they, I, I do everything for them. And then they still slow me down. Like right now I'm still waiting for, like last year I applied for disaster financial assistance and I submitted off the application and the application is supposed to take 30 to 45 days for you to process the application. So my application was sent in on January 17th. Um, and today is April 19th and I'm still waiting. I still got to go through the third level of review. So I went through the evaluator, then the first supervisor, then the second supervisor. Now it's got to go through the third supervisor to approve my claim to get it out. Last year, we spent about $150,000 just doing this work under emergency measures to save the property. And so we're sitting here. So we're sitting here out those funds that were supposed to be reimbursed under the program were sitting there in the delay in the housing project and all these other items and you're i'm just i'm just shaking my head why i mean we're not um a big company and we don't have we don't have a huge bank account we work for our money so we work and earn our money every single day and that's how we fund this. We're self-funding and our homeowners are funding our project with us. So it's, it's a, like, a, so when they, they give a, a hit to me, they give a hit to other homeowners. So eventually it'll be 26 homeowners that they, the province keeps and the RM McGinley decides that they want to, you know, kick to the knees. Like why, like what benefit is it to the province or the tax base, or to any of the constituents when this happens. And what will happen is that as I go through this process and I hire more lawyers and we do run through all the appeals and we go through the settlement process because the province of Manitoba will never want to see me in court because I'm too well documented and I, I'm too good um, a witness. Um, I'm not somebody they ever want to put on a witness stand. That would be terrible for them. And they know that. So eventually we'll come through the point where um, the province of Manitoba will pay me a settlement. And then the RM of Gimli, they'll lose the municipal appeal and they'll pay us money out of the coffers of the taxpayer for the RM of Gimli. But not only do I have to pay for my cost for legal, the RM of Gimli is making me pay their costs. As part of the development process, they charge the developer their legal costs. Every time they do up a draft of a developer's agreement that doesn't even meet a legal standard of competence, I get the bill for it. So if you believe that this kind of story is really important to be shown, Please go over rebelfieldreport.com. On this website, you can donate what you can to just help us to continue our job to cover the other side of the story, to show you what is happening across the globe.